Project Binky in Colour. Starring Nick Blackhurst. Also starring Richard Brunning. And Rex Hamilton as Abraham Lincoln. Tonight's episode, Balance of Power. Coming up in episode 31, I find something else we don't need on the internet. Ooh. Nick injures himself. <coughs> again. <coughs> and we both unearth a piece of cardboard that hasn't been turned into a template. Yet. At the end of the previous episode, we'd taken the old 3S GTE engine and completely stripped, modified, tuned and rebuilt it into something that should power the Mini to a respectable performance. Then I panicked and added some safety. The extra safety is being provided by this Garrett GTX 3582R turbocharger. It has a billet compressor wheel and a monstrous 4 inch inlet along with a dual ball bearing oil and water cooled centre cartridge. This should give us all the safety we'll ever need. What Nick's, what Nick's doing is wondering what the bloody hell he's supposed to do with this sodding great thing. It's hard to get a handle on just how big this turbo is, so here's some merch for scale. Now it could be said that in every aspect bar safety, this turbo is completely inappropriate for our application or the space we've got available. But the safest route is never usually the easiest route, which is why lots of accidents happen. So we've got it. I think the only thing to do is to try and fit it to the engine. And to do that, we're going to start with the transmission. Okay, right. Yep, that makes sense in Nick's head, I'm sure. But for the rest of us, we'll have to wait and see whether there's any method in his madness. In the meantime, the inescapable fact is that this gearbox is minging, and we can't in all conscience contemplate putting it back in the Mini without a thorough clean. It's been kicking around for years, and there's probably all sorts of detritus hiding within, so the most sensible thing to do is to strip the whole thing down, inspect it fully, replace any parts that are worn out, clean the whole thing, and then bang it back together. So, that's what we're doing. First thing to come off is the transfer box. Nice catch. Then the gearbox end case is removed. After whipping off fifth selector and gears, the main case is unbolted and split in half to reveal the gear cluster and the front diff. After fiddling with the oil pipes and selector rods and various other mechanisms, the main gear clusters can be pulled out. Followed by the diff. We're going to have the cases vapour blasted to get rid of the years of crud and bring them back to their former glory. So all the bearing races, plugs and seals etc need to come out to give us bare aluminium castings. We'll save you the tedium of the rest of the strip down and cut straight to a shot of the naked cases. Time for a road trip back over to powder coating Shropshire to see Andy, who's got a vapour blasting cabinet. Thousands of tiny glass beads are suspended in water and then forced out of a nozzle at very high pressure towards whatever's being cleaned. As well as being extremely effective at removing ingrained grime, the process has the added effect of peening over the edges of the pores in the aluminium, effectively sealing the surface, making it easier to keep clean. The beads get absolutely everywhere, which is why all the bearing races and everything had to be stripped out of the casings, because if any were left hiding inside, that could spell a nasty end for the transmission. After a thorough rinse and dry cycle, this is the result of the vapour blasting. It's quite the difference. So the casings are sorted, and the internals have been inspected, and it's nearly time to put it all back together. But before we do, it's over to our deputy gearbox editor, Mr Nick Blackhurst. While I've got these transmission internals out on the bench, I thought I might try and explain how it all works. So, drive from your engine goes through your clutch plate, which is splined onto this input shaft here, transmits power into the gears, which are all fixed to the shaft. You actually change gear by engaging the synchro hearings, which in essence is what is attached to your gear stick. Whatever gear you're in, drives this pinion on the final drive, which then drives the crown wheel, which is attached to this diff. 
So this whole lot is pretty much exactly like most other front wheel drive manual gearboxes. This particular transmission gets interesting when you get to this diff. This is where the 50-50 torque split permanent four wheel drive happens. I hope we're all familiar with how a normal differential works. This is that. You've got a spider with your sun and planet or side and spur gears, whatever we want to call them. It's just in this instance, there's two sets. One set for the front, one set for the center. Forget about the front for now. Now this is of course useless as a four wheel drive system because both the front and center differentials are open. So you could still in theory get one wheel spinning and that is where the central viscous coupling comes in. The viscous coupling is just this shiny bit here, and inside it, there's a stack up of metal plates with holes in, running in a thick oil. Everything inside here is carefully engineered so that the plates can turn relative to each other at low speed. The minute that becomes high speed, the oil is too thick to get round the plates or through the holes, so it locks all of the plates together. Every other of these plates is connected to this housing here, which takes drive to the rear axle, via this hypoid gear and the prop shaft. The other plates, the front ones, are connected by that shaft we had a minute ago from inside. All goes together something like this. So, in simple terms, any slip on the front or the rear wheels causes this viscous coupling to lock this shaft, which is taking drive to the rear diff, to this shaft, which is taking drive across to the front diff in here. But I know what you're thinking. Three concentric spline shafts just isn't enough. Well, you're in luck. Whilst the side gear and output for the front diff left-hand drive shaft is right on the outside here, to get the drive right the way through and across the right-hand drive, we need a fourth spline shaft. Which lives there like that. Obviously, this is a male spline, and our drive shaft has also got a male spline, so we've got a combined adapter and bearing carrier that goes on the end. Car. Simple. Let's see if we can get it back together. A little while ago, we started off with this grimy looking thing, but now the Mini's gearbox has been reassembled and it's looking resplendent. New bolts where we could, but mainly stripped and replated, as were all the other manky metal bits. Let's see if it still goes through the gears after all that. Well that was a lot of work. So much work, in fact, we didn't have time to feature it all in this episode. So if you're bored enough to be interested in how we did it, keep an eye out for the accompanying video. Now as far as this episode goes, it's back to our scheduled programming, which is fitting the turbo. Uh, transmission, obviously. Before we can wrestle the gearbox on, there's a couple of components that need to be bolted to the motor, namely the flywheel and clutch. Trouble is, we can't fit them with the engine on the stand, so we're going to have to have it dangling precariously from the crane for a while. First up to go back on the engine are the dowels that locate the gearbox. Then the cover plate goes on. Can't forget that, as it's impossible to fit once the engine and gearbox are together. Next up is our lightened flywheel, along with a set of uprated ARP bolts. All torqued to spec, of course. The machined face of the flywheel is covered in a light film of oil, so it's vital this is removed before installing the clutch. Talking of which, we're using this ACT six puck ceramotallic sprung centered heavy duty clutch kit. The alignment tool was barely any use at all, so I'm mainly relying on my calibrated eye-chrometers to line up the plate. This whole assembly was balanced with the crank and pulley, so we've had to line up all the markings to make sure it's installed the same way it was balanced. The cover also needs talking down. 
After smearing some lovely pink grease around, the final job before the mating process is to install the release bearing and fork. I bet that hurt. Now here comes the fun part. Take one. All right. Sometimes they go straight on, sometimes they fight you for hours, but in the end they always come round to our way of thinking. On this occasion, I wandered off to make another brew, and while I was doing that, the engine sort of fell onto the gearbox. My lack of input at the crucial point was coincidental. Anyway, the gearbox and engine are held together by just four bolts, including this tricky little blighter accessed from underneath. Then there's this cast steel bracket that connects the transfer box to the block. We've broken out the show spanners to do these fasteners up. A newly replated stud is wound in here, before yet another sodding great bracket, and you thought we were obsessed, firms up the connection between the engine and the transmission even further. Not falling off any time soon. I'd hope not. Anyway, now we can drop the engine down on the bench with the transmission on at the same level and angle as it sits in the car, so we can maintain all our datums. Next job, and we're getting to the turbo soon I promise, is to sort these water pipes that come out from the water pump and across in between the turbo and the block. Because of their location, we thought it prudent to insulate them from the heat of the turbo by wrapping them in some Thermoflect hose sleeve. This is easy to install, and if nothing else, will protect the lovely British racing green paintwork. This little silicon joiner hose is also in a vulnerable spot, so it too gets some heat management treatment. We're expecting the underbonnet temperatures to be pretty sweltering, so the more we can do now, the better. More on that in a few minutes. In the meantime, I think Nick's nearly finished fiddling with his sheath, and the result is quite neat. Damn sight better than the original. Indeed. Right, let's get those pipes on so we can move on to more interesting stuff. Now we can think about fitting the turbo. Before we do that though, we've got to revisit the exhaust manifold. It's all very well getting the exhaust gases from the engine to the turbo, but what we're going to need for efficient boost control is a wastegate. A wastegate is a device that diverts exhaust gases away from the turbo and back into the exhaust system. By controlling the flow of gas and therefore energy into the turbo, we can control the amount of boost being created. Packaging constraints often mean the wastegate can't be situated in an ideal location, but happily, we reckon ours should be spot on. How much gas is diverted away from the turbo at any one time is decided by the ECU and controlled by the boost control solenoid. It uses boost pressure from inside the inlet manifold to control a diaphragm in the wastegate which is held against a spring. It's a simple but reasonably effective system. With the wastegate flange welded on, you can now see that the exhaust gas has two choices, up into the turbo or down through the wastegate. It'll always take the path of least resistance, so when the wastegate is open, it'll choose the easy life and escape into the exhaust. To complete the manifold, we've welded on a tab which the turbo support bracket will be bolted to, and now that's the exhaust manifold finished. It's actually not quite finished yet. We're going back to see Andy, who's going to help us try and keep the underbonnet temperatures under control. As well as doing a fine line in blasting and powder coating, Andy also does ceramic coating, and that's what we've come back for today. After blasting it with a special media, the manifold is baked in the oven to burn off any impurities. We can't handle it now, or the coating won't stick. Nick's gone for yet another shade of grey, this one optimistically called Glacier Titanium. This coating is very expensive, and the efficiency and longevity of the job is, like most things, down to the preparation. But done right, like Andy does, 
we should see temperatures reduced by 15 to 20 percent, which for us is significant. It's touch dry after a few hours, but will take four to five days to fully cure before running it. The finish is really good and it looks terrific. We also had the turbine housing coated at the same time. Nice! To go with the fresh exhaust manifold, we've splashed out on some new studs and nuts. Fine threads in old aluminium castings are rarely fantastic, especially in a high stress application. And as Marty recently found out, that's especially true of the 3S GTE. And I've had problems with these in the past, so when we had all the head work done, we've also had all of these dreamed out and a steel insert put in with a more coarse thread. That's a job much easier when the engine is out of the car. Imagine trying to helicoil those holes in something like a Mark II MR2, for example. Bugger that. With a new exhaust gasket installed, now the manifold can go on. I feel the copper exhaust nuts clash somewhat with the gold passivate finish on the other fasteners, but function is more important than form in this instance. I don't know about you, but that wobbly bench is doing my head in. But never mind all that, it's time to bolt on the turbo. Cool, that's quite the snail. And I note that Nix eschewed the gold bolts and opted for some zinc plated grade 12.9 cap heads. I hope he doesn't lose any sleep over the mismatch. I'm sure there is a proper torque setting for these bolts, but we're going for FT and calling it done. I think all in all, that turbo installation is about as compact as we can make it, and with good reason. It's all got to go in the front of a Mini. Anyone that's done a turbo conversion will know, bolting one of these on is in fact the easy bit. It's all the stuff that goes with this that eventually ends up frying your Swede. A turbo like ours needs a decent oil feed, and here's the original Toyota version. Our new one does the same job, only with a little more panache and style. And AN fittings. The oil will flow up the new braided hose and into the turbo through this very expensive banjo bolt, with the flow restrictor integrated into it, to save space. The new Boss has an O-ring on both sides, because the more normal use of crush washers, well it's so last season. The Dash 4 PTFE lined braided hose has stainless steel fittings on either end, and it's the same stuff we used for the clutch line. It should be perfectly reliable. But just to give it a little more protection, we're using some heat sleeve on this line too. At the other end of the line, you can see the banjo bolt with the integrated restrictor. The restrictor just dials down the amount of oil flowing into the turbo, so it doesn't blow past the seals and make the turbo smoke like an old chimney. The bolt is done up with a 9 16 AF spanner. I fundamentally object to any fasteners that aren't metric, but there's no escaping bloody fractions with these motorsport fittings, so we keep a set of imperial tools around for moments just like these. So that's another one of the vital little jobs ticked off the list. Equally as important is the oil drain. The correct size and routing of your oil drain has a marked impact on the longevity of your turbo, so we're making our own to be doubly sure. There's three parts to ours, the top tube, which bolts to the turbo, the bottom tube, which bolts to the sump, and the wibbly bit in the middle, which connects the two. This is the top tube being finished off with the TIG welder. It's very nice. There's the bottom tube, which is equally as good. This will bolt to an O-ringed boss, which was welded into the sump in the relocated position before we had it powder coated. Finally, we need some Dash 10 oil line to connect the two tubes together. After some plating and painting, this is the finished oil drain. Access to the bolts is quite tricky, but a 9.525mm drive extension gives us the leverage we need to get it tight. And then the bottom pipe is attached to the new boss on the sump. A brace of flanged nylocks secure the oil drain. And that's about as good a route as you're likely to get. Time to turn our attention to cooling the turbo. And it should be as easy as using a couple of these banjos with a hose tail, but we can't because the orientation of the turbo means we'd burn through the hoses. So a modification is necessary. 
The last thing we need is for the intense heat of the turbo to melt the water hoses. So we're making the tube that's closest to the turbo out of steel and bringing the end where the water pipes fit down away from the heat. After being bent through 90 degrees, the new metal tube is carefully tigged onto the banjo. And there you have it, a water feed tube that won't melt in the heat. It's no good painting these water fittings as they're going to get very hot indeed. So we've broken out the plating kit once more to put a nice gold passivated finish on them. That should stop any corrosion as well as being sufficiently heat resistant. After a minute or so in the passivate bath, the fittings are rinsed off and dried, and they look glorious. Nothing else for it but to bolt them to the turbo. Having lots of lovely clean pipes is great, but we've got to connect them all together, starting with this one on the back of the block. A 135 degree silicon joiner hose takes care of that. Then we bolt on the vapor blasted original water manifold, which has takeoffs for sensors, as well as the top hose to the radiator and the connections to the turbo cooling. There, that's all sorted. Time to bolt on something else. This time it's the wastegate. Our tile 44mm unit should be man enough for the job, I would have thought. Seen this a few times. I always want to make sure the seat's in here before you put it on. The wastegate is fixed to the manifold using a V-band clamp. And we're using stainless steel John Guest style push-in air fittings. Uh, we'll tighten all that up later when the actual installation's finished. Probably need to move it around. We've repurposed and reimagined the original turbo support bracket that now has a banana shaped bend in it to clear the wastegate. Toit. Like a toyger. Right, now that the turbo and the wastegate position are set, we can move on and finish the downpipe. The wastegate itself needs an outlet, but it's illegal and obnoxious and we haven't got room to have a screamer pipe exhausting into the air, so we're plumbing it back into the downpipe. The little flexi section allows for some expansion and vibration resistance, but it's mainly there so we can actually fit it to the wastegate. While we've got the TIG out, the downpipe itself needs a little stainless steel tab which will allow us to bolt it to a bracket mounted to the engine. It needs a hole for a nice big bolt, and then it needs attaching to the exhaust. You'll probably remember that the downpipe wasn't finished, it came up the side of the chassis leg and just sort of terminated there. Well, now with the turbo in place, we can finally finish it off. Starting with a 90 degree bend split in half and then a dirty great big hole drilled into it for the mounting of a wide band oxygen sensor. An oxygen or O2 sensor measures the air to fuel ratio in the exhaust and allows the ECU to fine tune the amount of fuel being injected into the cylinders. This leads to better efficiency and more power. Because more power equals more better. After tacking the next bend on, it can now get fully welded round. The two bends have turned the exhaust through 90 degrees and now it's a straight run to the turbo. The downpipe is connected to the turbo with the use of a V-band clamp and the flange for the clamp is now tigged onto the exhaust. This hole being given the carbide burr treatment is for the wastegate outlet pipe to tee into. And here is that pipe being welded into the main exhaust. Here's the bracket I spoke about just now that will support the downpipe. It's quite sturdy, but there's plenty of speed holes to keep the mass to a minimum. 
The exhaust was also ceramic coated in that glassy titanium colour to match the turbine housing and manifold. With all this colour coordination going on, I'm convinced Nick is trying to channel his inner Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, but without the flowing locks and effeminate shirts. V-band clamps can be tricky little blighters sometimes, as there's no tolerance for misalignment, but he got there in the end. The lower support is bolted up before you can see why the flexi was so important on the wastegate outlet. It just wouldn't have been possible to fit it without one. Hold the phone! What's going on here? The holes are miles apart! Have you screwed up again, mate? Come on now. Ah, yeah, the little drop brackety thing. I knew that. I was just testing. You might be wondering why none of the exhaust system is done up tight. Well, it's because, and I don't think you'll be surprised by this, it's all got to come off again, as the turbo needs a blanket and the downpipe needs wrapping. We're serious about the underbonnet temperatures, so we're going to throw the kitchen sink at it. Not literally, that would damage stuff. You can see in this shot the design of the wastegate installation. The exhaust gases have an equal choice. Go up into the turbo to produce boost, or down through the wastegate so we can control the boost. Hopefully, this along with the four-port BCS will give us excellent and reliable control. With that lot all fitted, I can now carry on redressing the engine with all the bits and pieces you've already seen. I mean, I say fitted, it's all bolted to the engine, but there's no way it's going to fit under the bonnet. Uh, put on some heavy slippers and jump up and down in it till it latches. In that case, we either go full cleater spec and leave it off, or we just extend the front a few inches and don't say anything. Here's all the brackets and bits and bobs that you've seen before, but now they've been powder coated, painted or plated. It's just a simple job of bolting them all back on the engine now. We had the whole flexi drive assembly balanced at the same time as the crank, flywheel, front pulley and clutch. We also bought a new uprated alternator, one that puts out a few more amps than the original Rover one, as we're running a few more electrical systems than the ZR did. The AC pump got refurbished, yes that is the same one as we had before but it now looks like a new one. And finally, the old starter motor got junked and a nice remanufactured one should give us the reliable cranking we require. All right, whack the inlet manifold on and we are done. Uh, yeah, um, I've been meaning to talk to you about that more. To make the most of the large modern turbo we've now fitted, we're going to need a host of supporting modifications, starting with, but not limited to, the inlet manifold. Left to his own devices, I'm pretty sure that Nick would want to fit an inch and three quarter SU, but I've come up with something a little more suitable. The only slight snag is, it won't quite fit this hole. Oh no. So while my colleague gets on with tweaking this, I'm going to get the funk out.
Well, that's the lovely job on the inlet manifold, but we're not done yet. Our Celica was fitted with a TVIS system to improve the lowdown performance, but we don't need any of that crap, so we're throwing it away and using a phenolic spacer in its place. We need to match the ports on the manifold to the same shape and size as the new spacer, so still short of some engineer's blue, a little black Sharpie ink will do the trick. Once we've got our coloured surface, we use drill shanks as dowels to locate the phenolic spacer. Then we can bolt the spacer on tight, knowing it's in the right place. You can see how much material needs taking out around the edges of the inlet manifold to match the spacer. Next, using a sharp scriber to trace the outline of the spacer onto the face of the manifold. The TVIS system used two separate intake runners for each cylinder, one of which being equipped with a butterfly valve that can either open or close that runner. The spacer doesn't have the divider in the middle, so we're going to knife edge the manifold to try and increase the airflow. The TVIS system worked very well on stock engines to increase the low down grunt but also the top end performance. The valve would open via a vacuum powered actuator at around 4100 RPM and the effect was demonstrable. Later engines ditched the system completely and it was superseded by variable valve timing which offered similar effects but much more precise control. It's a restriction and unnecessary complication on highly tuned 3S engines which is why we're junking it. After some careful work with various abrasives the last job is to sand the face flat with some wet and dry. And there you have it, one modified port matched inlet manifold with large vacuum takeoff and flange for a new larger throttle body. Lovely. We gave it the old vapour blasting treatment and it's come up really well. So with that sorted, Nick can bolt it to the engine. Woohoo! Woohoo indeed, but that's only half the job. We've got injectors and fuel rail, we've got sensors and coils. We've got to make a wiring loom before any of this will work. Oh, I see. Tune in next time for another exciting episode from the files of Project Binky.